All right, so this is a suggestion via Discord. The name of the video is uh, 15 Historical Facts That Will Disturb You. We shall see. Let's check it out. He brainstorms this list for all the different uses for the phonograph. Hello, hello, hello. The world we live in is millions of years old. Billions of years old. And in that time, there have been several occurrences and events that have happened and which have pretty much shaped the planet as we know it. These events are pretty much split between the good, the bad, and the ugly. Although some of them have been massaged and modified to be more accommodating of the times we live in right now, history is one thing that never really changes. Right now, it is time to look into some of the most disturbing and accurate historical facts that have been unearthed over the years. So join us on this journey. Some of these facts might not necessarily be the most important, but they are still pretty unnerving. Let's dive in, shall we? Let's do it. Number 15, the morbid history of dentures. If you have dental issues, such as missing teeth or mouth tissues today, it's pretty easy for you to just slip on a pair of dentures. After all, these things are pretty much available wherever you want to find them. However, not many people understand the weird history of dentures. And trust me, it's a pretty disturbing tale. Today, dentures can be made from materials like composite resin or porcelain. However, back in the 1800s and early 1900s, these materials weren't necessarily available, but people still lost teeth from the high sugar diets to dangerous teeth whitening methods and a general lack of knowledge about dental hygiene, people lost teeth at even higher rates back in the day. And whenever they lost teeth, they'd need to replace them. Yeah, guys, to my knowledge, a lot of people used like wood. That was an option. Or uh, they would basically use teeth from the people that they purchased. So it was time to pretty much look for unconventional channels. Right, for most go. rich people at the time, the solution was simple. Get teeth from deceased people and put them in their mouths. That's hey, after option. all, it wasn't like these people <laughs> needed their teeth anymore. What? The phenomenon even got its own name, Waterloo teeth. It was used to describe the removal of dead soldiers' teeth on the battlefields of Waterloo. Of course, it is worth noting that some rich people also got teeth directly from the mouths of poorer people. These poor guys would be more than happy to pluck their teeth out of for a quick buck, and the rich people were more than happy to pay for them. So it was a win-win. Other denture materials included ivory, wood, and even the teeth of animals. I think we can all agree that none of these actually seem like a good option. Nah. Number 14, stained no. church glass. If you walk into pretty much any old church today, you'll notice the walls being decorated with lovely stained glass. Some of this glass could even depict artwork, such as the Last Supper or an other historical relevant event in the Bible. But have you ever considered how this glass was made? Because it's pretty gnarly. Most of these paintings are done using stained glass, a texture of glass that has been used in since the 6th century. However, back in 1112, a German monk wrote a journal about the creation of this beautiful colored glass. As he detailed, the creation of colored glass starts with the addition of materials like sand and potash at a high temperature. After adding a stabilizer and metallic oxides, they would be able to color the glass directly. However, once the glass has been shaped, the smallest details in the artwork are usually added by paint. This paint is made from materials like copper and lead mixed with a little bit of urine. Yes, PP. Urine is essentially used as a diluter for the metallic oxides. It helped improve their fusion with the glass during the firing process, essentially making sure that the glass and all of the paint combined perfectly. So whatever you got into in those old-timey churches, keep in mind that some of those paintings you see might just have the element of P in them. Right. Yikes. Number 13, the original leather-bound books. Well, that's weird. These Dang. days, it's pretty difficult for you to find books that are bound in original leather. I mean, even if you find leather-bound books, you'll eventually see that it's some form of synthetic leather and not the real thing. Generally. However, leather-bound books definitely exist. And back in the day, the leather used to wrap texts was quite original. I mean, way too original. These guys took originality to a limit. Here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that there was a point when the leather found on things like books and shoes was from people? This is true. It's a phenomenon known as anthropodermic bibliography and describes the act of getting the skin of humans, fashioning it into some form of leather, and using that material to cover books and texts. The method of fashioning human skin into a book cover was pretty similar to the method of using actual leather. 
The only difference, of course, was that instead of getting skin from animals like cows, these authors decided to get human skin instead. Okay, how are you getting it? Allegedly, the books were usually made from the skins of executed convicts and criminals. Again, they don't have a use for their skin, so I'm pretty uh. sure one crazy person just thought at some point that they could use people's skins to wrap book. Not many books made of human skin are still in circulation today. Yeah, I'm almost positive that like, none of them are in circulation. However, just take a moment to imagine how many there could have been, as well as how people would react in the afterlife if they found out that their bodies had been used to wrap friggin' books. I mean, they can't react. Number 12, the story of Minnie Dean. Minnie Dean. So personally, I have a general fear of babysitters and caregivers. It's not okay. that I don't trust them. It's just right. that I tend to be skeptical of people who I've not known all my life. Right. And after finding out the story of Minnie Dean, I've pretty much become even stauncher in my skepticism. Wilhelmina Minnie Dean was and remains the first and only woman to ever be legally hanged in New Zealand. In the mid-1800s, Minnie had been running a babysitting operation in her hometown of Winton, New Zealand. Minnie had been pretty successful initially. At some point, she could have anywhere between three and nine kids in her care. Okay. However, considering the infant mortality rates at this period, it was quite inevitable that some of the children in Minnie's care would die. And when they started to die, questions were asked. In 1889, a six-month-old baby in Minnie's care sadly died. Two years later, another six-week-old baby died. Authorities eventually launched investigations into these deaths as well as the conditions over at Minnie's home. The investigations found some pretty interesting things. For one, while the kids had been pretty much healthy, Minnie's home was assessed to have been inadequate to care for them. Investigators also found three more dead child bodies in Minnie's home. Even worse was the fact that Minnie had reportedly been looking for more children to join her daycare service oh, and yeah? had even been taking out life insurance policies on several of the children. Other findings include the fact that Minnie had allegedly been drugged the children in her care and had been taking weird trips with them. Christ Church police eventually had enough to charge her and she was eventually found guilty of murder. In August 1895, Minnie was hanged. Minnie has continued to be a regular fixture in the New Zealand folklore to date. Okay. Some legends even claim that plants wouldn't grow on her grave. But in the world of nannies, she definitely got to be one of the most infamous names. All right. Well, going forward, I'm not sure I like babysitters. All right. <laughs> uh, specifically, if the kid can't like fully speak yet. Right? I'm not sure I'm going to be comfortable with that going forward. Maybe I shouldn't have seen this. All right. Because I've already been kind of on the, you know, on the edge of allowing this to happen. You know, a uh, babysitter to exist in my life. Right. But now I don't know. Number 11, the That's history no. of the American flag. The American flag, as we know it, is one of the most popular flags in the world. Right. Okay? America. However, what many might not know is that this flag had a pretty unlikely history. The Star Spangled Banner, as many know it, was designed by Robert G. Heft. Rob was born in Saginaw, Michigan, and he was raised by his grandparents in Lancaster, Ohio, Good old Saginaw. after his parents separated. While he was a junior in high school, Rob's American history teacher, Stanley Pratt, gave the class an assignment to create a project that showed their interest in history. The 17-year-old Rob decided to give the American flag a redesign. At the time, America had only 48 states. However, Rob knew that Hawaii and Alaska were likely to join the fold, so he designed a flag that featured 50 stars. With an old pattern of the American flag, as well as tools like blue cotton fabric and a cardboard pattern, Rob came up with what is now known as the American flag. Interestingly, however, he only got a B- for his effort when he submitted his project. His teacher marked the 50 stars as a mistake and decided not to give the, the full score. Come on, bro. Rob's teacher claimed that he had changed the gray from A if Congress accepted the flag design. And despite being about one of 1,500 people to submit flag designs, Rob went all the way to his congressman's house and submitted it nonetheless. In what can only be described as a miracle, Rob's design was eventually chosen out of the multitude. And by Independence Day 1960, his design was officially adopted as the country's official banner. Rob eventually returned to Lancaster High School, where his teacher made good on his promise and changed the grade on his assignment to an A. So kids, here's a how many years later was this? lesson for you. If you've ever given a high school assignment, give it your all. You never really know. That's fair. Number 10, <laughs> The Pope's War on Cats. Religion is one of the most fascinating things in the world today. However, back in the day, one pope took religious beliefs a bit too far, to the point where it almost caused a pandemic in the most karma-filled way possible. 
Back in 1227, the Catholic Church was led by Pope Gregory IX. The Pope had somehow believed that cats carried the spirit of Satan around. They do. In fact. Sorry, don't like cats. And weren't to be trusted. So it was pretty much his mission, as well as that of the church, to exterminate these cats. Well, well, okay, that, Due to it, that's a bit much, bro. His massive influence over the populace, Paul Gregory the Ninth convinced many people to pretty much get rid of cats around them. And when the plague came along during his reign, the Pope was further convinced that the devil had been so angry at his crusade against these felines that he brought the disease against humanity. So the Pope doubled down on exterminating cats from society. At this time, black cats were especially the targets of hunters. After all, these cats already had black skin, so it was thought that they carried the devil's spirit. Pretty logical, right? Here's the thing, though. According to scientists at the time, the plague had been caused by fleas. Animals, which on their own, traveled on rats. Right, and with cats yeah. being so few to keep the growth of rats at bay, the fleas spread even more. And so did the plague. Imagine the look on the old Pope's face when reality finally dawned on him. Ooh, boy. Number 9. Thomas Edison's Talking Doll Thomas Edison was one of the most revered inventors of his time. Known for his contributions to things like electricity, mass communication, and sound recording, what? Edison created a lot of things, from the electrograph, vote recorder... Okay, hold on. Wait a second. Edison was rich. Edison bought a lot of inventions from people, then patented them. Um, was he the creator of things that you buy? I don't know. I don't think I don't think that's how that works, but I understand. You know, listen, I get it. He has all this, all these achievements and acclaim, right? Not trying to be disrespectful here, but uh, he had money. He bought things from poor people and put his name on them. To motion pictures. But like every inventor, Edison also had a few commercial flops. And among his collection, none was as creepy as the phonographic doll. Back in 1890, the Edison Phonograph Toy Manufacturing Company created a phonograph doll as a kid's toy. The toy was actually quite revolutionary, as it stood 22 inches and it featured a removable phonograph that played one nursery rhyme. Some of the rhymes included Mary Had a Little Lamb, Jack and Jill, and Hickory Dickory Dock. All the child had to do was rotate the hand crank and the doll's back, and it would start singing. Hey, listen, you could say that that failed, but there are a lot of dolls that make noise. Normally, you'd think that such a revolutionary doll would be able to sell big numbers. But for all intended purposes, the phonograph doll was a commercial failure. For one, people didn't like the fact that they had to rotate the hand crank to make a doll sing. There's also the fact that the wax records wore out pretty quick, and many children found the dolls and their singing to be a bit frightening. I mean, just <laughs> listen to the voice of one of them. Oh no. However you slice it, these dolls were haunting, and they ended up selling for only six weeks before they were taken off the shelves. Most of the dolls available today are only for historical reference, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's the stuff of nightmares. Number eight, Mozart's Dirty Songs. He had a lot of these nasty ones, bro. Like the letters that Mozart would write to his family members, specifically one of them, about how it was, never mind. Guys, look, research. I'm not gonna say it because this video is gonna get like sniped by YouTube, but there was a lot of like, like, backdoor fudge, you know, oriented type of, you know, love letters he wrote to his family members. <laughs> that, he liked number twos, guys. He, he really, he really, really liked number twos, guys. Mainly his families. In the world of music, it's pretty unlikely not to have heard Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Mozart was, and still is, one of the greatest and most talented music composers to ever have lived. Despite only living for 35 years, Mozart was a maestro in every sense of the word. He had been composing music before he was 10 years old, and even centuries after his life was sadly cut short, his works are still held in high repute. Now, when you think of Mozart, you think of opera. People decked in their yep. finest clothing, mm -hmm. sitting in an orderly manner, and listening to right. the finest music. Oh, yeah. However, the actual Mozart was anything but appropriate. Bro. Throughout his career, Mozart wrote a lot of songs dedicated to vulgar things. One of his earliest compositions was titled Lech Mich I'm Arsch. Hopefully he doesn't uh, translate that, but you can pretty much figure that out, I'm sure. All right, I'm telling you, he liked it. 
it. He liked it a lot. <clears throat> Which translates to lick me in the ass. He also wrote another song about dropping defecating into your bed and manipulating a song's lyrics because he knew that the person he composed it for would only sound vulgar when reciting it. For a person mm. with such taste in music, I'm pretty confused as to how Mozart really loved licking backsides. Aren't you? Question right. mark? Number seven, Genghis Khan. Dirty ones at that, guys. Keep that in mind. Dirty back. Dirty ones. Nasty ones. His cousins. On Climate Hero. Ask anyone to give you a list of the worst men to ever live, and I'm pretty sure you'd hear about Genghis Khan on that list. The Mongolian warlord was famous for his exploits in the 12th century, where he consolidated a small, 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 small yeah, yeah, set small. of Mongolian tribes <laughs> and turned his little operation into an empire that ran from the Pacific Ocean to the Baltic Sea. Genghis was a pretty brutal dictator, and at his height, his Mongol empire was known for quite literally running into settlements and pillaging them. The empire invaded over 22% of the Earth's surface, resulting in an estimated 40 million people dead. About four times the mortality rate of World War I and II. The amazing thing about the Mongol Empire was that they invaded so much land and territory that they literally had effect on climate change. During their reign, the Mongols assassinated so many people that they left large swaths of land in their wake. With this land being depopulated, there was no one to farm. Thus, forests were able to grow once again and trees started to sprout. Scientists estimate that the Mongol Whoa. Empire led to the extermination of about 700 million tons of carbon into the atmosphere. Genghis is the only historical figure to have introduced global cooling, so, but to do so, he had to kill a significant portion of the world population. Right. So, do you think it was worth it? Number six, James no. Jameson's <laughs> cannibalism fetish. I enjoy having Jameson Irish whiskey. I love its blend and rich taste, as well as its easy journey down the old gullet. But when I found out about one family member who founded this whiskey empire, it was a pretty bitter gulp to swallow. James S. Jameson was the great-great-grandson of John Jameson, the founder of the popular Irish Whiskey Company. He was the heir to the family fortune, and like many heirs of his stature, he was an adventurer. James had money to tag along on the expeditions of other established explorers, and in 1888, he joined an expedition across Central Africa. While he was in the Congo, James decided to commit a truly unspeakable act. But let me speak on it. Accounts of the event vary from James's diary to his wife and even a translator. However, they all agree that James had been in command of the rear column of the expedition of Ripakiba, a trading post in the Congo that was renowned for its cannibal population. A translator on the trip explained that James had wanted to see cannibalism firsthand and he ended up paying six handkerchiefs for a 10-year-old tribe girl, who was then tied to a tree and pretty much given as free food to the cannibals in the region. Even worse, old James was reported to have drawn and made watercolor paintings of the event while it happened. Yeah, I think that's enough Jameson whiskey for me for a while. What? Oh, gross. Number five, Whoa. The Shadows of the Dead. World War II was one of the most pivotal events in human history, oh, that's not necessarily crazy. because of the conflict, but because of the aftermath. As many know, the tide of war really turned after the U.S. Army dropped atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of right. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right. Right. However, after the entire rubble had pretty much cleared out, what the bombs left was just as haunting and devastating as mm -hmm. that they caused. According to accounts, people who searched the rubble found black shadows of humans, as yeah. well as those objects like bicycles and cars scattered around the sidewalks of the cities. These shadows ended up being known as the shadows of the dead, and they pretty much leave a haunting image of what must have been when those bombs hit near Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Scientists believe that when bombs exploded, the intense heat and light spread out from the implosion point. Objects and people in this path pretty much shielded their eyes, shielded the objects behind them, absorbing the energy and light. So the surrounding light bleached the stone or concrete, causing these shadows. Even now, after almost a century, some of these shadows remain stained on the pavements and sidewalks. Now that's how you get memorabilia. I mean, I would have figured you probably would have you know, covered those up, bro. Number four, Martin Cooney's incubators. Today, incubators are pretty much a staple at every hospital. These devices help save the lives of babies who were born prematurely, allowing them to have a chance at a normal life. But these machines didn't have a smooth introduction to the world, and they only did thanks to the relatively controversial efforts of one man. Martin Cooney, 
was an American medical professional who had the luck of working with and studying under Dr. Pierre Constant Boudin, considered the founder of modern neonatal medicine. Boudin had developed an early concept of the incubator as far back as 1897 and even exhibited it, but doctors were hesitant to use it as machines. This hesitancy was for several reasons. First, many believed that premature babies were only fit for a death at that time. There's also the fact that the single incubator cost about 75,000 grand to build at the time. Well, over $1.5 million in today's money. Still, after using an incubator to save the life of his own daughter, who had been born prematurely, Cooney was adamant that the use of this technology be expanded. Cooney knew that a lot of people loved looking at their peers who had been born prematurely and who had looked different. So he set up two sideshows at Coney Island where he displayed premature children in incubators, machines which at the time he called hatcheries. He charged people who wanted to see these children, and over the years, he managed to raise enough money to keep the operation going. Coney ended up saving over 6,500 lives. I mean, listen, this sounds absolutely terrible, but at least there's, there was kind of some good that came out of this. Cause... Throughout his operation, and even though it was definitely controversial, to say the least. Yeah, it's bad. Number three, Pharaoh Pepe the Second and Flies. The Egyptian empire was one of the largest in the history of mankind, and for a person who ruled such as an empire, you could only imagine how much power and influence they'd have? Well, in the case of Pharaoh Pepe II, he might have taken things to a weird level. Pepe II began his reign as the tender age of six during his sixth dynasty of Egypt's old kingdom. Some believe he reigned between 64 to 94 years, and while his reign was relatively chill, he did seem to have a weird hatred for flies and bugs. Pepe II allegedly hated flies more than anything, not surprising since he was pretty much a kid when he took over to the throne. But it's weird, however, where the links he'd go to avoid contact with these animals, according to records, Pepe II would keep naked slaves close to him, bathing them with honey from head to toe. This way I the mean... slaves would attract the flies and bugs <laughs> and not himself. That's By the crazy. end of their days, the slaves would be covered in sores, boils, and scars, uh -huh. and some of them even developed fatal diseases like cholera and malaria. I mean, I hate bugs as much as the next person, but chill out, bro. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, that's one way to do it. Like, if you, you, you hate flies that much, you lather someone up with honey, specifically, so they can get the flies and you can't, because that's a... That's, there are levels of savagery here, all right? There are absolutely interesting levels of savagery. And that's one of them. That's probably at least level two. The first one was obviously buying someone just to, you know, you know, that's crazy. Number two, Hitler and that's Disney. Number one. Adolf Hitler was no just the worst. Am I right? The Nazi dictator led a brutal campaign against Jews in the early 1900s, one of which culminated in a world war and six years of brutal conflict. However, even though he's been dead for the better part of a century now, several facts have been unearthed about old Hitler. One of those was the fact that Hitler apparently loved several Disney films. During his reign, Hitler prevented Germans from watching any American movies due to growing anti-Americanism. Nevertheless, he reportedly considered Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to be one of the greatest movies ever made. During a visit to Germany in 1938, Roy Disney, one of the founders of the Walt Disney Company, sold Snow White to the Nazi propaganda ministry. Even though Germans weren't able to see it, De Führer reportedly had a copy delivered to his private movie theater. An art student when he was much younger, Hitler was also reportedly had drawings of Disney characters even as an adult. The dictator was so in love with movies that he reportedly liked to watch three or more in a row after dinner. Would this prevent me from watching Ant-Man, Quantumania, or any new Disney movies i'm still on the fence to be honest mm -hmm. number one the leningrad famine to complete our list let's take a stroll through leningrad russia back in september of 1941 at the height of world war ii leningrad known now as saint petersburg had been the ussr's second largest city so when the nazis decided to invade the country leningrad was immediately a major target the nazis were determined to bring leningrad to heel and when they went on a brutal campaign where they blocked the city from pretty much all supplies, by September of that year, the only connection between Leningrad and the outside world was a water route near Lake Ladoga. The rest of the city was entirely blocked by German and Finnish forces. For a total of 872 days, the people of Leningrad went through one of the worst famines in human history. In less than three years, the city's population plunged from 2.5 million to under 800,000. Leningrad literally got no critical supplies, including food, wood, coal, or gas. Once winter hit, civilians were literally trying to stay alive in negative 40 degree temperatures without any food. 
Soon enough, people started to bring their possessions just to make fire. As time went on, things only got worse. According to reports, people would literally leave their homes and never return. Well, At first, it was assumed like that? that these people died in the cold, but authorities drew a link between rising disappearances and the sudden availability of meat in the markets. Most of these meats were labeled horse or dog meat, but it was obvious that the Russians had literally started eating themselves <laughs> just to survive. There are officially about 2,000 cases of cannibalism in this period, but it's believed to be much more. If there's something we should all know about this world, it's that it's pretty wild, and the facts outlined yeah. above should give you an idea of just how weird. I sure hope none of these oh. facts give you horror dreams tonight. Oh, yeah, but just bro. in case, let us know if you've come across any haunting facts, and be sure to sleep close to someone tonight. Okay, 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 listen, there were a couple of them that have absolutely disturbed me, all right? Uh, mainly the one with the incubators, using them for, like, sideshow purposes while saving their life. Yes, you're saving their life, but is it worth the the stares and, like, overall public ridicule, guys? Is it? I don't know. Uh, and then the one about Mini Dean. Uh, that one there is absolutely frightening. I would hate to leave my kid with someone, uh, and that someone is someone like that. That frightens me more than probably anything I can actually imagine here, guys. All right? But all right, listen, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day. Enjoy your day thoroughly.